Hello and welcome to the London Bulls podcast with me, Tom, and the big man himself, KD. Hey. How are you, mate? You well? Very good, thank you. We're in a different surrounding area. We are. It's very exciting, isn't it? Is it? Indeed. As some of you may have noticed, we've got, uh, we've got a guest with us today, the Hereford FC chairman, Steve Ammons. How are you, Steve? You well? Very well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, well, Delighted to meet you two. Starting, <laughs> yeah, starting well, on stage and screen already. I, I can quite understand. Um, <laughs> no, you know, thank you very much for coming on. Um, we really appreciate you reaching out um, and you know, the, your positive comments, but also your help um, over this last couple of weeks. Pleasure. Uh, it's been really, nice. really nice. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are and, <laughs> and why, why you're in this position. <laughs> Yeah, very good question, actually. So sitting here today a year on from the announcement on April Fool's Day, which in yeah. itself probably sums everything up, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah no, I'm um, Herefordshire born and bred, shopped and that. Um, shopped in airport, obviously, famously. That's probably the most famous thing about it. Um, yeah, born and bred, Herefordian, been coming, came to my first game. Uh, I know this was a question online. I came to my first game in 1983, Boxing Day 1983. My grandfather bought me a 1 0 home defeat against Crew Alexandra. And you'd have thought I'd learned my lesson that day, wouldn't you? It summed up so, summed up so much of the next 40 <laughs> odd years, didn't it? Um, so, yes, that was my first game. I think I just must have annoyed my grandfather about going to a light game. He wasn't particularly a Hereford fan, but he brought me. We stood under the Len Western stand, I think. If I were, well, I can't recall it, but I know we stood under yeah. there. Um, and then towards the end of that season, I came to a couple more games. I don't know how I came to a couple more games. I think. I think we played Reading at home and then York City on the last day of the season and York City were champions mm -hmm. so there was a really big crowd on that day and I remember and how we beat them 2-1 and I was leaning on the wall at the front of the meadow end and I can't remember what the, how the goal the game went or anything but I remember one of the goals was scored there was a pitch invasion a level right. pitch invasion, and there were just people jumping over me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think on the pitch. I have never. I'm proud to say I've never been on a pitch as a, a Herefordshire. I've got pretty close on the pitch. Don't, don't get me wrong. And a couple of times, maybe if I was closer, I would have gone on. Um, but yeah, I've never been on. But yeah, and that was it really. And then the following season, eighty four, eighty five, was clearly a season that we probably should have gone up. Mm -hmm. We finished fifth. Mm -hmm. We had a really good John Newman side with you know Chrissy Price, Kevin Rose, Pedge. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Harvey, still my all-time favourite Hereford player. Yeah. Um, Stu Phillips, mm -hmm. Kearns, and Ollie Kearns and all that. That was the Arsenal season, the Arsenal season, season yeah. yeah. That was the Arsenal, yeah. I mean, I sat in the Len Western uh, that day, my, my mum and dad, mm -hmm. and um, I think one of my, maybe one of my brothers. Um, yeah, and just bonkers. I, 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 I sit here now sometimes and I just laugh about 15,777 <laughs> people <laughs> leaving their <laughs> street. I just, I can't. Yeah, our health and safety was a little bit different back then, wasn't it? But it was. So, yeah, so I was kind of hooked really then. Um, and, you know, I've been, been coming ever since, you know, a bit like everybody, you, you support sort of ebbs and flows depending on where you are in your life in terms of actually attending games. But, um, in terms of following results and following the scores, you never miss them. You never no, miss no, them. You always see them, but you, you know, your life takes you different directions, and, and that's it. Uh, yeah, no, just stuck with it. Been stuck with it ever since. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we, you know, the one thing that we've obviously had this season um, is National League TV, which has been great for us. Um, I mean, how does that? Um, what does the club benefit from National League TV? Um, not not particularly this year at all, honest financially. I mean, it's great from a fan's perspective. Obviously, you know, there's been games I haven't been able to go to midweek because I have a day job, mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to log in and watch it, which is fantastic, and it's great for your exiled supporters, isn't it? Um, but the reality is, it's not making money for clubs. I mean, the worst thing that happened was Wrexham and Notts County being promoted from the National mm -hmm. League, really, because they had big followings and big audience mm -hmm. figures. Um, and then the money was sort of shared out and drip fed between all the other clubs, but with the loss of those two clubs, um, there isn't that. There isn't the money being made this year that there was. I mean, there weren't massive sums last year, but there was some benefit more last year. So I think it's more of a service than anything else. I think, yeah. to be fair, we are one of the clubs that does come out of it in credit financially, mm -hmm. and, but again, the money gets shared between all the clubs, yeah. and that's simply because of our fan base and the people that do want to watch the game. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's good that it's done. It's just, it's just a difficult thing, I think, to make work, because you have, there's such disparity between the really? sizes of the clubs. You yeah. know, some clubs, you know, you've got some clubs in the National League with really small attendances, and they're not, you know, just naturally not going to get bigger away, yeah. you're not going to get bigger viewing figures. So it's, it's quite complex, I think. It's something the National League are looking at quite a bit, I think. Mm -hmm. Stig, I want to say, you know, first anniversary. Yes. I can't believe how quick it's gone. Yeah. 
Sometimes I feel like I've been here forever, and other times it does feel like it was like just yesterday. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's quite surreal. It's it's still quite surreal at times, actually. And it was something I never never sought out, never really. Had, no, I never imagined. You don't ever imagine you could end up being chairman of your football club, do you? I mean, it's ludicrous. Um, well, failing that dream of a lottery win, and you can suddenly pump five well, million a year. I think something. we'd all like that's, that. that's probably <laughs> that's probably the one way in my mind I've, I've thought about doing it. But um, yeah, it was just interesting. I mean, obviously, I was here in the first season after the demise of Hereford United. Um, and I ended, and I really ended up here because I just helped the group of sort of businessmen who put together the plan for Hereford FC. I didn't know any of them um, particularly well. Well, I didn't really know any of them at all. The only one I knew who was kind of involved in the group at the time was George Webb, and that was only because we'd fallen out on a cricket field about a hundred times <laughs> over the years. Um, I didn't know any of the rest of it, but I just they approached me and just sort of said, you know, potentially it doesn't look like Hereford United might not end well. Mm. Um, and I was already of the view that probably the only way that things were going to be resolved was sadly in the end game that eventually played out. Um, and they just said, well, listen, we'd, we'd like to sort of go out there and let people know there may be another way forward. Would you help us? And I just got involved with them really and just sort of helped them with their messaging. And, you know, because nobody wanted to look like wishing Hereford United into a grave at that mm -hmm. point in time but equally it was important that people kind of knew there might be hope beyond it mm -hmm. so I literally just helped with PR for them just behind the scenes just voluntary <laughs> voluntary the theme of my life at the moment, <laughs> um, and did that and then off the back of doing that for quite a prolonged period of time I was involved with a pitch to the council for the lease on the ground I went and presented to the council as part of the team and then they, and they got to see said right we've, we've got the ground now we've formed the club how do you fancy going in there as the employee and at the time I was sort of I'd finished I finished the job I was in working for the police mm -hmm. and I was doing PR for myself so actually I wasn't in a job at the time if you like tied yeah. into a job so I was able to do it and it was a bit of a, a labour of love that first year it wasn't mm -hmm. particularly fine it didn't benefit me much financially even though it was a paid job but it was a bit of a labour of love and it was just amazing so and then it obviously fast forward however long and I think things have got a bit fractured here I think it's fair to say there was a little bit of break between the there was a split between the pitch and the fans you know and it happens doesn't it over time and obviously <laughs> Josh's time here had ended and I just think um, and I just got approached really and, and just sort of said would you, would you ever would you ever give any thought to joining the board maybe coming on the board because I think we need, need to help with the PR and communications mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. to try and bring things back together um, I thought about it long and hard spoke to my missus about it and you know because she she would know that if it was going to happen I'd end up all in probably mm -hmm. Because I was obsessed enough about the place without being involved, and um, so I decided to give it a go. Got voted onto the board, well, invited onto the board, and then it was a case of obviously at the time John Hale hadn't long left, so needed to nominate a chairman, and it was just kind of like actually, I've come, I'm coming to bring my PR and comms experience and ideas on that side of things. So, almost maybe I'm the best person to try and drive that forward mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody else having to put across my ideas and that was pretty much how it happened really. I put my hand up and said, well, I'll put my name in and obviously there was a vote and, and, and I and I got the role. So yeah. I mean that day a year ago today with mental really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely mad. And I said this to loads of people because my son was playing football he was playing football against Eastern United on the morning and then the game there was a game here in the afternoon. And and sort of my family knew that I I joined the board really, although I hadn't formally announced at that point I can't quite remember maybe it just had um, and then literally the game finished and it, and he, it was a nil nil draw and he was fuming because he'd had no service he got in the car and then we were going to go straight from Evesham United to the game here mm -hmm. and I said before before we leave you need to read this and it was the draft of the press release that was about to go out just after midday because mm -hmm. I refused to have it on April <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me he was just like you're kidding and I went no that's it so literally we got here and we laughed now and he spent the entire day giggling as we pulled up parked the car and the announcement had gone out while we were driving from Eastern here got out of the car and from the very first first person I saw it was like I'd said an edict out that everybody had to refer to me as Mr Chairman because <laughs> I got out of the car and everybody knows me as Stig literally the first person I saw was Mr Chairman Mr Chairman and for the entire day Freddie, my lad, is behind me, and I could just hear him because <laughs> everybody that called me Mr. Chair, we just giggled behind him. It was the funniest thing. And he got me, I've had the best day ever. <laughs> it was just yeah. bizarre. So, 
So yeah, so that's how it all came about, really. Um, I didn't want to ask you actually. So obviously, all, all fans believe they know what's best, yeah. what, what should be done. And is it what you thought it'd be like coming in as chairman, or has it been harder? Uh, it's, it's been incredibly challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never kid anybody, like, kid anybody on that I'm an experienced businessman. I'm not. I've always been employed in jobs and PR and communications jobs. Um, so I would never kid people on that I've run a business really. Um, and the stuff that you have to consider here, because it, it, it's, it's almost like there are almost three straight four businesses in one here. You obviously have the football, which is obviously the main driver for everything. But then you have the bars and events business off the side of things. You've got the commercial side of the business. Yeah. So it's just, it's massive and you can't really understand it. Clearly, when I came in, not long after we came in, well, the first thing I did, walked into a job, walked in, and the first two things I had to do was set season ticket prices and appoint a manager. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't I had to do that, we had to do that as the board, mm -hmm. but you lead on it, you kind yeah, of, you're yeah. the figurehead. So you're like, you're, you're kind of dealing with the two most unpopular decisions potentially that you could possibly do in the first <laughs> month. So that, was, so that was quite interesting. And then obviously the kind of true financial picture became a bit clearer mm -hmm. about six, sort of five, six weeks after the end of the season and that. And that was a real shock. Uh, yeah. in terms of the reality of it and you know it's a head in your hands moment when you think bloody hell yeah. how are we going to how, where do we go from here kind of thing and it was mm -hmm. and although the decisions were made before I was arrived to start cutting cutting the club's cloth accordingly it wasn't going to be enough clearly mm -hmm. because of what we then found yeah. so it was it was quite scary and that, you know I think the reality is if I like if I didn't know that picture when I was thinking of taking on the job, the reality is probably I'd have run away and been scared off because really? of, because of the fact that I haven't yeah, got yeah. the experience. Yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah. I'm delighted I wasn't mm -hmm. because actually it's been quite you know to get your teeth into it. But I think if the reality I'd have just gone, I don't think I, I'm not, whether I'm not capable of doing it or I just don't know whether mm -hmm. I'm the right person to try and help <laughs> deal with it kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, do, you, do you think that's been the toughest part of being chairman? Certainly this this past year has been the financial side. Or is it a case of it's a sort of big umbrella and there's a lot going on all the time? I, I de yeah, I think the financial side has been the hardest thing. Uh, I'm not looking for any sympathy, but you know, you stay awake at night and you're thinking, mm -hmm. how are we going to address that? How are we going to do that? You know, when you know the reality is we were down, you know, from the reserves that we built up over those first three years of excitement, we were down to decision. We had, we, you know, we had five thousand pounds in the bank and not nothing else. Mm. You know, and you're kind of a bit like. Right here we go. Now you always sell season tickets in May, so you begin you begin to build that up again. But you've got a your season ticket money. You spread it over the course of the entire season. That's how it works. I mean, you know, I was naive to that almost. I didn't, you know, that's how inexperienced I was. Like, yeah. I go, right, we sell really good season tickets. We could probably invest a bit in the playing squad. And you've got people shaking their head like that. <laughs> no, no. What happens is we spread the all the season ticket income. We need to spread across the season over the course every month by month because. You can't rely on gate money, mm -hmm. and what had been a real issue was at the end of the previous season, after you know Josh being Josh was sacked, and then Jan came in. The gates had just fallen off a cliff, mm -hmm. so that last three months of the twenty two twenty three season, the gates had been horrendous, really, mm -hmm. and so the, the income levels had dropped off massively. So yeah, the challenge of the financial aspect was was hard because you've got to wrestle. You're wrestling with you've got to cut, you've got to create efficiencies. We've got to bring that. We've got to rein in on the spending. But actually, you've got to try and make enough available to put a competitive product on the field. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't put a competitive product on the field, you don't get the people through the gates. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's, it's your worst nightmare, really. Because that whatever anybody says about football club, if the football's not working, the rest of it isn't going to work. It only thrives off the football. Mm -hmm. We've been incredibly fortunate with the football. It, it, you know, it, you know, it's no word of a lie that. The way the football has gone this year has probably bailed the club out of what was an enormous hole, sure. like an enormous hole. And you meant, you know, you were involved in hiring Paul Cadiz. Yeah. Um, what was it that stood out for you about him in the interviews? Because he obviously hasn't got a lot of manager no. experience. He was that far before, but no. you know, what was it in those interviews that stood out? Can I tell you the funniest thing about it is? Can you imagine appointing, trying being part of the team, appointing manager for your own football club? <laughs> now that was weird. Yeah. That was just like this is bonkers, by the way. Is kind of, I know you're a bit. I know can you about you know the old football manager challenge, but it was like yeah. it was a bit like real yeah. life. Um, it was funny, obviously, yeah, the process is kind of, it obviously been done a few times and um, 
prior to Paul being appointed, obviously they'd gone through the process before to try and appoint a manager and it hadn't quite worked out in the end, so they almost had to go back to square one and start again. So again, you, you know, you invite applications, it's the mission manager you expect, really. You invite applications, you get your applications. Nick, our football secretary, would then go through them and he'd sort of go, well, KD, not a chance. He's only done football manager, for example. So, so, you, so you were ruled out, sorry. Look, you were ruled out. You know, and see, then Nick sort of brings it down to a realistic list, if you like, of possible to consider. And, we then, and then as a board, we all go through those lists, go through with the CVs we've been sent, and then you try and sort of go, right, we're all pick a list of say seven or eight mm -hmm. and then maybe look at who's got the most votes and then you go from there and that's your short list to interview. Mm -hmm. So we, we so we shortlisted we, we kind of got a short list of six or seven together. Again, there's a lot of time passed. Um, but Paul was one of the last applications to come in. Mm -hmm. We were kind of almost settling on what our short list was going to be. And it came in and it was just a bit left field really. I mean as I said he didn't he's never kidded anybody kidded anybody on he had any experience, any of that sort of stuff. But there was just something about it. His CV was obviously playing wise, was pretty impressive. Yeah. You know, you'd be captain in Birmingham City, you'd be captain at Swindon. Obviously, and you think, well, there's obviously going, there's going to be some leadership kind of. So it's kind of actually let's just, let's add him in because the first round was a forty. We we did forty five just informal forty five minute interviews, um, and you know I'm happy to say there was me, Jamie Griffiths, general manager, Nick Marsh, football secretary, and Graham Turner. Mm -hmm. um, so the four of us, and we just invited seven candidates, eight candidates, and we. Interviewed most of them off site because of the blooming jungle drums and all that sort of stuff in Hereford. Yeah. And then we did do an interview a couple of the late ones here. And Paul was the very last interview we had on the day. And he obviously travelled down from Lytham, where he's based. Um, I think he was here about an hour and 45 minutes before the start of his interview, but that's the type of fellow he is. And we went through all the interviews. So, actually, all the interviews, all these informal interviews were really good. No one, like, there was no one who went, well, he's not, he's not. You could not imagine him on the bench or whatever. Mm. But then we got Paul in, and actually we, we put 45 minutes aside for every interview. And I, I have never asked him actually, but he must, I don't know whether he thought maybe he had a stinker, because he literally was done in 25 minutes. Mm. And whether he left thinking, well, you know, he's driven all the way down from Ruddy Lytham for a 25 minute interview. But there was just something about him. He was clearly incredibly hungry in terms mm. of the way he was talking. He was incredibly passionate. He was obviously desperate for an opportunity. Um, although he's, he covered the same ground that most of the other candidates did, but just in a much more concise, simple, straightforward way. And I think that comes across in his post-match interviews. Yeah. Um, and I left, and we did it in the boardroom, which is next door, and I sort of walked him, I showed him out, he was the last one. And as I was walking up the steps, I was thinking, I really like you. <laughs> I really like you. Kind of yeah, like, yeah. I was kind of thinking, mm. but then I'm thinking at the back of my mind, I've got Graham Turner's in there. If I walk back in and he's just, have I been, am I being taken for a fall here? Because yeah, yeah, you yeah, doubt yeah. yourself. Anyway, so I should certainly the pawn off he went. And I came back in and I walked in and I was thinking, God, I hope I haven't been, I hope I'm not mugged, I've not been mugged off here and they think he's useless. <laughs> and I looked at Graham and Nick, Graham and Jamie were all smiling and I, I think Graham said something like, I think we might have found the time that we'd be looking for all day. Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my, my feeling was that I'd, all day, and like I said, all the, all the candidates were very presentable. But even off, the, off that first meeting, I kind of just wanted somebody to grab me by the throat and say, this is my job. Mm -hmm. I want this job. I'm desperate to be Hereford FC manager. And that's what he got from Paul. And then we did the three, we interviewed three interviews and he was the final one. Um, and again, he just, to me, he just, whoever you appoint is going to be a risk. Yeah, of course. Um, the others were more experienced. But actually, how much more of a risk? I was a bit. How much more of a risk is it going for Paul than it is for any other somebody mm -hmm. else? Mm -hmm. And I just felt we maybe needed something a bit different. And as a board, we all kind of um, were in agreement that that was the way forward. And then, yeah, and it's turned out kind of how I hoped it would really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's you know he's fresh, young, um, enthusiastic. Like, you know that does come across in, in his interviews and the way that he goes about stuff on the pitch. Um, you mentioned uh, Graham Turner. Do you? Still talk to him? Does he still give you advice? And don't talk to him that re regularly in terms of touching base. I know Paul's touched him, spoken to him three, or, three or four times. Obviously, he's been to the game. He came to the Blythe game. Mm -hmm. He was a guest in hospitality. Mm -hmm. He knows he's always welcome. He's funny, Graham, because for all that he did here, he's still a bit kind of reticent if he doesn't get a. You know, I said to him as he was leaving on the day of Blythe game, "You are welcome whenever. Just ring us. Just let us know." But I don't think it's necessarily 
his style to put himself forward. I mean, he yeah. would do because he has brought friends on occasions. Yeah. But you know, to be fair, he gets an invite to Wolves sometimes. He goes to mm -hmm. Aston Villa and he does their games as well. But he's still clearly when he's here, he's incredibly passionate and he mm -hmm. still he still says we and that sort of <laughs> stuff, which is brilliant to hear. So great. and he's yeah, no, he's just. A, I mean, I still. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> and I was thinking that's so bizarre. That was just like the but it's very funny, bless him. But yeah, no, I mean he's just a legend for it in most yeah, parts, isn't he? Yeah, that's what he did for this whole. I think run. we, you know, you, I think we said it um, on one of the other uh, podcasts, but you, you start to realise now how good a job he did on the budget and getting a team out because you know we all know that we had a, maybe a core of sort of four or five players every season. But everyone else was new, and trying to get that team A together, which is something that Paul Callis yeah. has done this season. But in order to you know to keep it within budget and to to get them playing well, and and, and potentially you know fight for promotion or whatever, especially when we went back down to the conference and then going up again into League One. Um, you know, I think as I say, it's, it's he. He just sort of got on with it. He never asked anything. He never really moaned about it too much, you know. And he did just get on with it. He always wanted more money. He always wanted more funding. And you know, maybe that was the one bit that we didn't quite get right at that time was was how to raise more money for the club or to to you know put events on. I mean, I think when we were chatting before um, before we started today, you were talking about maybe wanting to try and get more events. Um, going, you know, um, upstairs, up in the top, um, race nights or, or you know, uh, getting maybe former players back or, or that sort of stuff. And that's something we've talked about trying to help with is, is um, obviously we've launched the um, the uh, Legends, uh, I can't remember the name of it, no, the Former Players oh, Association, that's it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and obviously we've tried to reach out to people down in the South East um, to get them back yeah. integrated with the club and, and that's maybe something we want to try and help the club with is, is getting in contact with people. You know? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we are really key. I mean, one thing I would say about Graham, you know, with everything, I completely endorse everything you'd say, but actually he took on the club and that was potentially a life-ruining mm -hmm. decision for him in mm -hmm. terms of the financial aspect. You know, we, he laughs about his wife wanting a new kitchen and it took about three years to get it because the money that was supposed to be for the kitchen he put into the football club. Mm. You know, and he kept it alive, he kept the club alive probably without, for whatever reason, whether it was guilt because he'd taken the club down. I don't, you know, out of the football league, yeah. it, you know, there might have been an element of that. Without what he was willing to do for the club at that particular time, it may have, you know, it may have died then because it was that, it was yeah, that, you know, they talk about that game away at Dover in the FA Cup, mm -hmm. which fourth qualifying round, we won the game 1-0, Gavin Williams scored, and then we drew Wrexham at home, and it was live on the BBC, and the money that then came mm -hmm. in as, as a result of that cup run was probably what allowed the club to stabilise and kick on, so, mm -hmm. you know, we should always be grateful for what Graham did back then, but yeah, just, yeah. I've talked about, you know, ideas about, because what, what, what's clear to me is he, obviously, the club is dependent on the gates, hugely, commercially, you know, we do okay, and I'm, and I'm confident we're going to be we're going to start to do even better. Mm -hmm. But you know, with the greatest one in the world, Hereford isn't the most affluent place in the world, so there'll always be a ceiling for what you can bring in commercially. Mm -hmm. So you are dependent on trying to get crowds through the gate, and again, that's difficult because again, it's not the most affluent place in the world, and we completely appreciate that it's not easy for supporters to commit to season tickets. But actually, what I'd like to do, and I, you know, which we were talking beforehand, it's that kind of you know, that tr traditional supporters club type feel that we used to have. And I'd almost like to be able to put on events and things upstairs and, you know, to raise some money and help the club. Because at the moment, the only way we've got to do it is through asking staff in the office to do it, really. And actually, it's carnage for them a lot of the time. They are so, so busy. And you can, yeah. you know, and I and I do hear sometimes fans critical, why do we need so many people? Well, we haven't got that many people. We've probably got three full-time, three part-time. Yeah. And everybody else volunteering. And everybody else volunteering. Um, but actually without that, the service that the fans expect, when you've got gates of 2,000, 2,500 this year, 
you expect a certain level of customer service. You've got to have that infrastructure. We can't compare ourselves to a, you know, Buxton later today or, or you know, or Peterborough Sports. They probably don't need the same level of customer service. So yeah, so what I would like, you know, one of the things I would like to try and do moving forward is if we could look at maybe having a, you know, like an unofficial supporters club, like we used to have in the old days, mm -hmm. you know, because I know Exeter City have got a supporters trust, but then they've got a supporters club. Mm -hmm. And if the supporters club, you know, could get a group who could put on an event once a month. We've got lots of possibilities of good events that we can run, yeah. but we're almost at our capacity in terms of being able to run them mm -hmm. from in, within yeah. what we've got. And it's great to hear what you're talking about in terms of the things that you're looking and doing. And I mean, particularly fantastic for the, you know, the exile groups that you have down in your neck of the wood, because it's, you know, I lived away for a long time myself and it is so important to feel you have that, that mm -hmm. connection. You know, I never, sad as it sounds, when you knew Hera from coming to play at Morecambe when I was living in Manchester, it was like two or three days before. Yeah, yeah. Saturday, yeah, you're right. going to go to Morecambe on Saturday or to Southport or whatever, and you just, you know, so that community feel is really, really important. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Buxton. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the upcoming run of fixtures we have. Uh, three very tough games this week, starting with Buxton, obviously, yeah. later, uh, Banbury on Wednesday and Scunthorpe on Saturday. Um, what are your general feelings about the upcoming fixtures? We're obviously in playoff contention at the moment. Um, and obviously, the Banbury game was postponed on Friday. Yeah. And, it's not an ideal situation with only one day recovery. No. Um, how are you feeling going into this week? No, well, we'll be careful what I say about the Buxton game because he's probably going to go out afterwards. Yeah. So, Can we edit this bit out? <laughs> <if> you're, <laughs> you're, you're wrong. Um, so I might steer clear of the Buxton game. Obviously, it's a home game, so we've got to be looking to try and win it this afternoon. You know, this afternoon, and, and actually going into these last few games, you know, wins, wins. Uh, that's the only thing that's going to be able to extend our season. Um, so yeah, I mean, Banbury on Wednesday night. Could be anything, couldn't it? In fairness, they, you know they're struggling. They're not, you know, you think they're looking at it. They're likely to go down, but they might have nothing to lose, might they? And you know, this is a really, really difficult league. That's the thing. You go to these places, you know, go to these places, and it doesn't matter what size crowd they've got. What it is, they're a challenge everywhere you go. I think one of the most eye-opening things for me this year has been the money that some of these clubs are spending on their squads. Mm -hmm. You know, we obviously have costs that they don't go for. You know, we're trying to compete for players and they go, you know, with the greatest respect, they're choosing players that are getting offered more money at a club with five gates for five hundred. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that you know that's maybe because there's an individual who's putting money in there mm -hmm. that we haven't got. But actually when you're competing, you know, when you're losing out on players to even clubs in the level below who mm -hmm. can offer more as a basic salary than we can, it kind of gets a bit depressing in some ways because mm -hmm. you do sort of think to yourself, Football's a bit of a basket case, really, in terms yeah. of some of the money being thrown around. You know, it's the same at every level, isn't it? But that's the that's one of the things that's been most eye-opening for me. But yeah, I mean, we've you know, the reality is we've probably got to win at least three of the last five mm -hmm. to have any chance. Mm -hmm. Probably four, I would say. Yeah. But you know, from my point of view, to be sat here talking about that going into the last five exactly. games, that it's yeah. even a possibility, yeah. even if it is a little bit of a long shot, is mm -hmm. is pretty remarkable, really, in terms of the progress. You know that's been made and the job that's been done by not just Paul and Runes but also the players themselves really because I think they've been they've been an absolute credit to themselves mm -hmm. this year mm -hmm. absolute credit you know to the club I spoke to them before the it's not my style at all really in terms of wanting to go and speak to people out loud but I went to I went to the training ground on the Thursday before the Kings Lynn game you were talking about the games this season but next season um, in terms of, of budget and the plans for next season, obviously very much depends on where we are. Yeah. Um, if we were to stay in this league, do we see an increased budget for next season? We've got to try and give an increased budget for next season, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it's not straightforward and we will, I'm sure there will be an increased budget for next season, what that will be is. Um, still kind of not I wouldn't say to be decided but we still have unknowns that we're dealing with. Um, you know, whatever the increase will be, it probably won't be as much as Paul would like. Mm -hmm. And probably you could argue probably not as much as Paul deserves. Sure. Um, given the job he's done. But the reality of it, the situation is we're still kind of on the comeback trail from a pretty desperate situation. Mm -hmm. We're obviously in negotiations and discussions with the council about the demolition of the Blackfriars end and what, mm -hmm. potent what potentially might then end up being there. Now, what's going to be built, excuse me, at that end is probably a little bit away, a little bit further away, mm -hmm. and we don't really have that much control over that because at the end of the day, it will be the council development. 
but we do have infrastructure costs that we've got to be aware of in terms of we've got equipment that will be moving from that end. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a floodlight situation that we've got to address because those pylons aren't going to be able to stay there longer term. So we've kind of still, you know, you can say unfortunately, but it's for good reasons, got to be very careful with the profit that we might make this year. You know, there's got to be a percentage of it that's got to be set aside. And, you know, as I said to you, we were down to less than, for, well, around £5,000 in the bank at the end of last season. Mm -hmm. We need to be putting money back in our reserves. We need to have a sizable contingency fund. This is an old ground. Um, if the meadow end blew off in a storm in three weeks' time, the meadow end roof, sorry, blew off, we've got to be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So we can't just, you know, throw as much money at things as we'd like to. So... Yeah, there will be an increase in the budget, I'm sure of that, I'm confident of that. Again, it won't be as much as Paul would like, I'm sure. And it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be as won't be as much as I would like and the rest of the board would like. Mm -hmm. But equally we have a we have that wider responsibility um, from the club. But we you know we are what I would say, and you know, for support is important to say for supporters really is I can't believe the position we've got to in a year. Yeah. I thought it was gonna take three years mm -hmm. probably to get ourselves back towards feeling a bit more stable because of where we'd come from. Mm -hmm. But to, thanks to Paul and the players yeah. and the fans coming through the gates, we are way ahead of mm -hmm. what I thought we might be able to be thinking about. So that's that's the real positive, I think, about everything. Or, you know, one of the real positives, there's quite a few positives actually, but that's one of the real positives is that we have kind of raced ahead of where we were going. We were ahead mm -hmm. of schedule on the pitch almost. Mm -hmm. And we're also ahead of schedule, really, in terms of the rescue mission off it, I would say, as well. So I wanted to just touch on a couple of things behind the scenes. So you mentioned Black Fries. Uh, we've seen some really cool photos come out yeah. um, of the student accommodation yeah, that yeah. will most likely be there. Is there any, um, has there been any discussions about what the stand would actually look like itself? Would it be an all seats to stand? Is that... We're, we are not, not detailed discussions okay. because we need to go and get we need to go and get some advice off the football <coughs> foundation. We need to work out what we'd want. Obviously, those the, the pictures that have been put out. It was obviously I understand why it's caused a great deal of excitement, mm -hmm. but they were really I mean they were pretty much just really formative yeah. artist impressions. Mm -hmm. They weren't really detailed designs of anything. Mm -hmm. I think it was the council kind of from a few years ago. This is what could be done. Yeah. Um, so I would expect when they actually get proper architects in to start putting forward pitches for what can be done at that end, it would be probably be very, very different, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand why people have got a bit fixated on those drawings. I would probably say that people don't, because that might no bear, bear, bear no resemblance to what's done there. But I guess when you're going through a process like the council, that'd be, you always need to put something mm -hmm. in black and white that people can see. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, we, we the, the council have committed to working closely with us. We're hoping that... Um, the council that they've always said that you know the stand will be included as part of the holder holder de development we've got to ensure that we get enough a foot big enough footprint for the stand and the size that we want for them to be designing um i think we've got to be realistic about what we're going to get there because at the end of the day it's not our development it's not our land it's not part of our lease mm -hmm. um but you know you want to have a stand of a decent enough size at that end because you know what we've got to think about is further down the line the meadow end might need to be developing mm -hmm. so you've got to be able to transfer fans to that end at that point in time so we want it to be of a decent size but we'll make it known to the council what we think we want what we think we need um we'll be understanding of their realities as well as our own and um so yeah it's a really interesting scenario the first priority is to get the lease sorted on the other three sides of the ground really and then that links into being able to lease the area we need at that end as part of that development once that gets going um, and, I'm, and that's progressing pretty well at the moment, actually. So hopefully over the next few weeks, we should be having some, some decent news around the lease side of things and stuff. Nice. Yeah. And um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is there's been a lot of uh, conversation on social media about changing our name back to yeah. Hereford United. Yeah. We're in our centenary year this year. Yeah. From the old club starting in 1924. Yeah. I just want to get your kind of thoughts on that. Who's, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to give a personal view on it. I was funny because someone approached me at Brackley the other week and said... I know you won't be able to answer this question, but bring back United, what do you think? And, um, and I said, well, I will I'll happily answer that question. I think he was a bit taken aback. Um, the first, I think it's important I say I'm not a shareholder, um, and the board don't really have in any say on whether we do or don't. It's a shareholder scenario. So what our individual views are is kind of a little bit irrelevant in many ways. I'm not a shareholder, so I wouldn't get a vote on it. I wouldn't get to do it. My personal view is, and I, have, and I knew... I, and, I, and I've got the advantage of this. 
This has never felt any different to me. Mm. Hereford FC has never felt any different to Hereford United, so I think that's an advantage for me because I know there are others who feel differently. Um, and my, my personal view on it, and, and I've said I've given it some thought because I knew I'd have to because I knew people would start asking me about it, is for me, Hereford United was the good, the bad and the ugly of all the time I supported it, which was, you know, 40 years. Not so much good as there was bad, because that's just the life of a football fan, particularly Hereford fans. But then the ugly was clearly how it ended and the direction of travel it went in the end. My feeling now, my feeling now is I reflect on it, is I think we, I would, my preference would be to respect the memory of Hereford United, the good, the bad and the ugly, by having that as all part of the story. Yeah. That was the Hereford United story, if you like. Mm -hmm. And then off the back of that, and only because of Hereford United, we're now into the Hereford FC story moving forward. And I think that, you know, my position is I think I think we respect Hereford United and part of the story was the sad demise in the end. Um, always have it represented on the club crest and I love the fact it's got Forever United on the club crest and on the back of the shirts and move forward to Hereford Football Club. But that's just a personal view. I've also got a 17 year old son who doesn't really know any different mm -hmm. than Hereford Football Club either. Yeah. And we have got quite a percentage of fans that don't know that, that few, don't know any different. A few people, I mean, um, one of the guys that uh, helps us with um, London Bulls, Stu Matthews has got a young lad and he said exactly the same thing as you. My brother-in-law said exactly the same thing in terms of they've got young lads who have never known any different. And, you know, we never knew any different when it was Hereford United. Um, and obviously we grew up with that and everything else, but they're growing up with Hereford FC. Um, you know, my, my opinion is that in some ways I would love it to go back to Hereford United because that's what I grew up with. But I think that's probably quite a selfish mm -hmm. point of view um, because, you know, the new club has achieved so much. And I think one thing I would say I differ in, in terms of um, Hereford United, Hereford FC sort of almost flow into one is, is probably obviously the end of Hereford United and, and the beginning of Hereford FC because it did feel like a totally new, not, not a new club because we came to the same place and we had some of the same players that we had before, yeah. same manager. So, you know, it wasn't that, it was more a case of we, because we were all trying to work out what this new club <laughs> would be called, <laughs> would look yeah. like, you know, the, the badge and everything else and how different it would feel. And obviously that first season in the Midland Premier League, you know, was was just, was probably one of the best seasons that I've ever had supporting the club. Because, yes, it was great when we were in, say, League One or, you know, we were playing Leicester and Leeds and, and, and those sort of things. But, you know, when we had, when we were going away to some of these little grounds and there was three, four, five hundred of us turning up yeah. and their average attendance was 30, you know, it, I just remember gazebos and, and you know, they put up at the last minute, you know, with a table and a, and a bin full of beer um, with water, you know, and that was, that was it. That's what they could, were trying to, they were trying to do what they could to cater for those fans very quickly. And I think a lot of those clubs did such a fantastic job based on the fact that they were all definitely volunteers and they wouldn't have had the money to really put into it. Um, and I think, you know, chance for a lot of fans that season, both Hereford and the opposition, was just, you know, was, was, was great. And, and also that for me was when, because we, myself, uh, my dad, my brother-in-law were members of the executive club then. So we were going in there and we were chatting to our players afterwards, which we hadn't really done much of before. Um, and then we were talking to the opposition players, you know, and, and it was very much like they talk about the FA Cup, your plumbers, your plasterers, you yeah. know, your postmen, all peeps, I don't remember what that was all about. Um, but yeah, and, and, and just talking to them, and I remember after one of the games, um, I think we won eight nil, and I think it might have even been <coughs> towards the end of the season, I don't know if it was the first season or, or, or not, but and Heena Town. It might have been the Heena game. I remember talking. I think yeah. it was, and I remember talking to their one of their defenders, and I said, "Actually, I didn't think you had a bad game." Yeah. And he was like, "Well, we lost eight 0 I said, "Yeah, but you didn't yeah. do that badly, you know." And it was. I think it was probably very odd for them because 
you know, they were talking to obviously fans of the opposition and who were just, we were just happy to have a team. Yeah. Even though we just won 8 0 <clears throat> that day, it was the fact that we, we were well, I think, I don't know if we, I think we had gone up by that point, but you know, it was the fact that we even just had that to, to look forward to, you know, um, and that's that's the Hereford FC yeah. side for me. And obviously, Wembley at the end of that season. Yeah, I think the key thing. For, I think the key thing for me is again, having you know, having talked about it, given my you know, it very much is a personal view. It's not a view of anybody else on the board or anything. That's my personal view. So actually, for me, it's all about Edgar Street was key to everything. Getting Edgar Street was key to everything, and if you get Edgar Street, then you can get the same feeling and then create the same feeling. And for me, I rock up or I rocked up after the, and it was like I was coming to Edgar Street. I was watching a team playing in white. Mm -hmm. Same supporters in the main set around me, so actually, you know, it had that different feel to me. And I, you know, I completely understand the sentimental attachment that people have to Hereford United because Hereford United will always be my club, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. but, I, but you know, I, I'm now, I think, I'm at ease with it. And I, I'm, I think, probably just, you know, let's carry on as we are, respecting the memory of Hereford United, as, the, as I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly <laughs> of it. Um, and that was the Hereford United story, and this is almost a new story. A, you know, a line, you know, conjoined to that, whatever the word is, but to the previous one. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to go into a couple of quick fire questions we had from fans yeah, this in. So obviously the Mayor of United, um, Lee Davis from Newcastle actually asked, is there going to be anything done this year to kind of commemorate the centenary year in terms of events, merchandise, is that? Oh, I would hope so, yeah, absolutely. We've obviously had a huge amount coming on this year to try and get put right, um, but we're well aware of the the date and the commemoration. Obviously, we talked about the match winner kits. Mm -hmm. The match winner kits are due to be, um, but it should be any time now. We should be getting into a position where we know what's happening with those. But obviously, we've got the match winner retro kits to come out, which will be fantastic. My son's yeah. always got he's, he's already got his name down for one of those, which is hilarious, <laughs> isn't it? Because he, yeah, yeah. he wouldn't know Hereford United, but he's straight in and he wants to kind of celebrate Hereford United, which is absolutely brilliant. So, so yeah, there will be things done, I'm sure. We've just yeah. got to get, we'll hopefully have a bit more time to plan in one, plan them once the close season lands. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a question from um, Tarquin who, who says, um, how would you rate the current season out of 10? Um, if, if you if you could, and who would your player of the season be? God, I get myself into trouble here. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I would probably go if if you if you marry if I if I go get with if you go with expectation against what's actually happened, mm -hmm. we're kind of eight and a half probably mm -hmm. um, in terms of where we are because they just we didn't have any right to have any expectations really. I don't think mm -hmm. um, you obviously have hope. That's, that's part of being a football fan. So yeah, I'm I'm an eight out of ten, eight and a half out of ten type person. Just given where we came, given where we come from, as much as anything. Um, so there we go. Uh, in terms of player of the season, putting me on the spot, I would probably go. I'd have to be, and it won't be any surprise. I would probably be in the Aaron Skinner or mm -hmm. Alex Babos camp, probably. Mm -hmm. Babs is a bit too creative for me, no matter what I used to play football like, so I'd probably, I'd probably, I'd probably go for a defensive element, so I'll go with skins, to be honest. But actually, yeah. there's a lot of choice. There is, yeah. there, You know, it's not a straightforward decision, which in itself says a lot about the type of season it's been. You know, you, you look all over the field, and actually there'll be people that you can, you know, there'll be players that you can attach to and get a fondness for and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, it's... And, you know that's a nice thing, and it's the fact that you know it's smart, It's a simple thing, isn't it? But how many players have got songs this year? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a simple yeah, little thing, yeah, isn't it? But there's that's a great great number of players who've got their own songs. I'll tell you what happened when we signed when we announced the signing of Alex Babos last week. It was oh, right. did you see that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sign the kitchen. <laughs> I told my daughter she liked she liked that. <laughs> and literally she goes, Dad, like that. Radio Two are playing Heaven and Earth by Belinda Carlisle. <laughs> it's, it's like the weirdest thing. I was like, no way. Yeah, I did tweet about it. Actually, actually, but it was just bizarre. <laughs> My daughter's like, that. <laughs> that. It's very funny. And we had a question from Jason at Lempster who said, communication with the fans has been massively improved this season. People love your updates with Jamie uh, and the in-person chats with Paul at the start of the season. What drove you to prioritise that transparent communication straight away and consistently throughout the season? Um, Obviously, my day job is PR and communications, which obviously helps. But equally, I'm a fan. I know what I want to see. I know what I think has been missing. And it's not a criticism of anybody, but I know what I think has been missing. I, my belief is, and again, it's my personal belief, is this isn't my club. It's not the board's club. It's not this club. It's everyone's club. Mm -hmm. So actually, there are always going to be things that we can't 
go public with. There are always going to be things that we have to keep quiet about. You know, we don't want you know we don't want to commercially reveal too. You know, so there are certain things commercially we wouldn't want to reveal. Equally, I don't. I'm not. I'm not enthusiastic about giving other teams a competitive advantage by revealing mm -hmm. figures and that sort of stuff. So there will always be things that you can't share. Um, but actually, there's an awful lot you can, I think, at a football yeah. club, and people care, people want to know, and I think people have the right to know. Paul's been very much of the same mould. Yeah. We were laughing about it before, but there has been suggestions that because I work in PR, I've helped, I've sort of advised Paul a bit on his bit, not a jot of it. The stuff that he's done has always been has been genuine from him, mm -hmm. um, and he's wanted to do that, and I think it's standard him in good standard him in great stead. Um, but I just think it's the right thing to do, and I think off the back of. If you like, there was a lack of trust that built up over a number of years, probably, for whatever reason. And whether that was right or wrong, there was a lack of trust. And I think to have any hope of starting to rebuild the trust and trying to get people to fall back in love with the club again and feel a reattachment to the club, we probably had to go down the route of being that. And it's not been the hand forced. And Jamie's been very much of the same opinion. Like I said, Jamie's a more, first and foremost, he's a long standing fan of the football club, even though he's. That doesn't mean down to him every day to do stuff. But, you know, that's it. So, so yeah, it's a simple thing, I think. In fairness, it's not rocket science, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand why people are fearful of doing it. But I just think it's been a really key thing that we needed to do moving forward. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think we have one more question from um, Bob. But I think we answered it earlier in terms of um, just talking about what can we expect next season budget-wise. Um, so hopefully we've answered that um, for you, Bob. Um, without the thing is, without this is, and I'm, I'm not looking to be negative about this, but I think it leaves probably going to be harder again next year. Mm -hmm. There might be more, there might be more full time teams in. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. teams coming down are going to be tough. Teams coming up, you might end up, you know, you're going up with Macclesfield in this league. Mm -hmm. Kitty look like they're coming down. You know, you tell, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. we could have some great. The good thing about that is we could have some really good fixtures as yes, well. Absolutely. But yeah. equally, it's going to be really, really tough. Mm -hmm. I think, and we all just need to be aware of that. I think. Mm -hmm. I think what I, what I would like to say, and it's a key thing. What, what what's really dawned on me this year, and I've said before, the importance of attendances and crowds. Now, if we can become a club that at, whose average attendances never drop below two thousand, mm -hmm. two thousand one hundred. If, that, if we can get that to be our baseline, even in the bad times, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of 1750, 1800, it would make a huge difference to the club because it just gives you a slightly more solid base to work from financially. So that's what I think we need to try and become, mm -hmm. is a club whose average attendances never fall below that kind of level. Yeah. You know, yeah. sadly they did last year because after Christmas things didn't go, uh, didn't go particularly well. Mm -hmm. But that... You know, if we can become that club, you know, if we could get to an average attendance, whatever was going to happen off two thousand two hundred, mm -hmm. then we have a, we have a real chance then moving forward. I think it's yeah. just you know, and it's a very that's a very basic mm -hmm. thing that I'd yeah. like us to try and become as a club. So, yeah, I think you know, match day the match day experience is is really important. You know, junior balls do so much good in terms of you know when they've done stuff outside. Obviously, they've got the um, uh, guard of honour and, and the penalties, etc. So, you know, I think it's always important to get kids involved and, and excited because then they'll come for the next 40 years, like, like you say you have, and, and we've, you know, come since we were young. It's, uh, we, we need to, yeah, that's, that's the, the vital things is getting families and, and kids and, and that along because then the dads and mums probably want to come. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, with prices, not, you know, not that we particularly charge um, a lot for, for this league, but... Just ensuring that families can yeah. can get here, have a good time, and hopefully good quality of football as well on the pitch. Yeah. But you know, and you know, my my, my nephews uh, absolutely love love football. But you know, they, they I said to my nephew uh, when I spoke to him yesterday, you know, if I see any of the players uh, when I go to the ground tomorrow, do you want me to who do you want me to have a photo with? And he's he he reeled off. Pretty much most of the team in the end, <laughs> but um, Jason Cowley was the one, and, and just having these kids and their heroes that are, uh, you know, Alex Bagos and, and you know Jason Cowley and Cissé, you know, and, and it's just it's great because that's what we grew up with, and we all grew up with. We that's all Andy Williams, so. yeah. That's 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 I saw you as a kid. <laughs> 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 <You're hard laughs> you know what? And it's like and it, it just it, you know, like I said, it's that inner child in you, isn't it? You know, I'm like that with players, you know, even now, which is which is ridiculous. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm a yeah. forty-eight year old. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit kind of like, uh, you know, and as I said, you know, I, I look back through my, you know, 
Jimmy Harvey, probably mm-hmm. now. I'm a bit of a mid, I'm kind of like, I'm a bit of a, I've got a soft spot for midfielders. So I like a Jimmy Harvey, mm-hmm. Richard Wilkins, John Narber, mm-hmm. Ben Smith, probably yeah. very close to Jimmy Harvey in terms of my favourite all time Hereford mm-hmm. player. But it's important to have those people, isn't it? And you know, and you just look back on them with such fondness, don't you? Mm-hmm. And you know, and, and I just laugh. I remember that first year, I was working here at the time, and I remember coming home one day. And I'd always said I'd never go to Wembley ever until Hereford got there. That's what I'd always said. I'd literally I'd got, I had the chance to go loads of times. And I was like, the first time I go to Wembley, it's to watch Hereford. I had, to be honest, I'd probably given up mm-hmm. thinking it's ever going to happen. So that was massive for me that first year. It was massive on many levels, wasn't it? But to get that that first year. But I'll never forget coming home from one, coming home from work here one day, coming in through the front door. I was not from London at the time. Walked in, they opened the front door, and my kids are singing the Aaron Birch song. <laughs> like, they haven't seen me coming, so they haven't prepped it up for me. And I, just, no, just I, I, I can hear my two kids singing, We've got Aaron Birch. So, and do you know when you just saw them? That yeah. is, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And it's just the funniest. And I just thought that was absolutely hilarious that the kids are singing that song. That's very new to me. That's great. Um, I think as so we're going to move on to some memories that you have okay. of. Um, Watching Hereford, and um, I mean, obviously you mentioned Wembley, but you've you've gone with the playoff final yeah. uh, against Halifax. Uh, talk about your memories of that day. You know how, how you remember things, um, if you can. Yeah, well, I think I think the thing about that day is it's like we suffered, didn't we? We had the two playoff defeats. The pre, I mean, that older shot even now still. I don't think I don't, I'm the count I'm still having counselling. <laughs> to be honest, that still even now stings, doesn't it? And obviously, we've been we've been through that period. We we had the relegation from the football league, then we had a real struggle in the conference, and then we started to rebuild a little bit, like we were talking about earlier. You'd have the Wrexham Cup game, which had mm-hmm. kind of brought us a bit of stability. Then we move forward, and then that you know we had some remarkable times, didn't we? I mean, that for that season, I think we lost it. We got hundred points and lost to Chester. Mm. I mean, the most attacking side you'll ever see in your life. Just yeah. an outstanding team that one. I mean, we were the best. We were the best team in the league that year. And then mm. we obviously then failed twice in the playoffs. You then get there for a third time, and you do. I think you naturally glass half empty as a football fan anyway. So then to Herif get Hereford fan, Herif fan and a football <laughs> fan, yeah. so then to get there and the Morgan game here was an extraordinary mm-hmm. fixture. Wanted to beat them after extra time with yeah. guy, with Big Geese score oh, scoring cool. that goal. So then to get there and I just you know everything just almost like for a week beforehand. I'm just thinking about the Sunday or whatever day mm-hmm. of the week it was. Um, and we went up on a mini bus from the family. Fred, my lad, 17, he, my wife was four months pregnant at the time, so I don't know how you, so I always say, you were there, Fred, that might have said, so, <laughs> I, don't know, I mean, I don't know how she didn't give birth there and then on yeah. the day, to be honest, <laughs> but I, um, people were worried, my sort of people were worried about me on the day because I could barely speak, mm-hmm. I was so hyped up and mm-hmm. so nervous, and people were like, go around a few pubs, so I don't think, they barely got a bloody word out of me at the end of the day, because I was just so, you know, when you just want something so badly, yeah. that I just kind of, I wasn't really there, I was there but wasn't there. Um, and then they did the national anthem, do you remember? Mm-hmm. Before the game, I burst into tears. Mm-hmm. I tried to sing it and got about a line in right. and just burst into tears. I think the whole nervous energy, I mean, God, I get a grip on you, but I just mm-hmm. literally sobbed like yeah. that was it. And then the game itself was just mental. <laughs> I think I remember John Grant scored. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they went ahead and you oh, no, not one of them days, then we scored and all that. Then John Grant scored, and he was obviously a former era for player as well. Yeah. Score for us much, did he? But then he scores <laughs> against us, which is typical. And I think I remember sitting down in my seat mm-hmm. and thinking, not again, kind of thing. You know, yeah, what I'm saying? you yeah, know, you just that kind of. I think it was a We don't come from behind twice. Seventy fifth minute or something. Yeah. Maybe he scores. Yeah, yeah, he was late on. You know. Yeah, we don't come from behind twice. You don't as a Arab fan. You're never going to do that. And then obviously, and the obviously, I think you talked about it, didn't you? The Andy Williams get off. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> comes on. I mean, it's a brilliant. It was a brilliant header. Yeah. Um, and then it was still. It was just, it was trauma, it wasn't fun, was it? I don't know, you know, it wasn't a fun day out, really. <laughs> but, you know, it's so just, not, it's no, just no, traumatic. No. And then obviously, Green is scoring, we were in that, we were kind of level with the penalty area in that corner. Right, yeah. Um, so, you know, so it happened, and then he, I mean, tried to spear a few people, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had to get the shirt. And, you know, I just, I, and you know, just after everything that had gone on, you know, I could get a bit choked about it now, yeah, really. But, um, yeah, just after everything that had gone on, we bloody deserve that. Mm-hmm. We deserve that day. Really, I think. Deserve that day. Mm-hmm. 
you know, our supporters, the lads who've missed out in the playoffs on the field in three year, two years in a row deserve that day. And it was just a brilliant, brilliant day. You know, the massive hordes of Hereford fans there that day. And just, you know, we haven't, over the years, we haven't, as a fan base, got to share that many great days mm -hmm. in reality. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, we had great individual days, but not momentous yes. days. And yeah. that was just one that you just look back on and go, no, no, neck. Yeah. What a day that was kind of thing. I'd yeah. say I get a bit choked about it now, almost. Mm -hmm. about it. You know, whenever I hear... Um, Simply the best by Tina Turner right, because yeah. that obviously was afterwards when we won. Yeah. That's I, it, it takes me straight back to, yeah. to singing it and, and just looking around and hearing everybody in that end singing yeah. Simply the Best. And you know, you, you definitely felt like we were that day. But but as you said, it's just those couple of seasons of, of you know how good we've been and to then go and do it again. Yeah. Just you know, look what we did and, and, and you know what what a time. I think it's a Hereford thing as well, and this sounds ridiculous, but it's that kind of, I think I had that kind of, this doesn't happen to us, yeah. type moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You're so used to dealing with, oh, so close. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then you have that kind of, and then you leave, and then for like days after this, you're like, I can't believe that. You know what I mean? And you just keep <laughs> reflecting on it and getting you a big smile. And like we've had, you know, we've had those individual moments. I've, even, I've had moments like that this year, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. in individual mm -hmm. games where I've thought, mm -hmm. I can't believe we won that, you know, Gloucester mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I saw someone had put on, I think one of the questions I saw on social media was, what's my highlight of the season? So I was thinking mm -hmm. about that. And actually, I think probably, while Gloucester, Gloucester away was brilliant, spending more at home was brilliant, and there have mm -hmm. been other games, I think Chester away mm -hmm. was oh, probably yeah. one, because we were, you know, we'd lost four on the bounce, I think. We were going to Chester, and we're thinking, I know we do all right at Chester generally, but yeah. they're clearly a good side every year. We're up against it. You go there and you score... You scored two in the last six minutes, and the second of which is like probably one of the best goals. I've yeah, ever seen. Well, probably yeah, one of the best yeah. Hereford goals I've ever seen live. Yeah, and that was another. Yeah. You kind of like leave the ground, and you just I can't believe that's just that's that's kind of thing. And that's, yeah, no, and that's how it, and that, that was it. But that that feeling was like magnified at <laughs> yeah. times at best of that day. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think in terms of this season, one of our highlights, especially as we were with the London Bulls in the pub in Marlborough when we drew three all with Alfreton, yeah. and it was that character of the team to come back from 3-1 down and as you said everybody was quite positive in the pub probably because we'd had a few to drink by this point but <laughs> you know and and when that last goal went in because it was Arsenal Porto that night yeah. and so in the other side of this pub was all these Arsenal fans wondering what the hell was going on because we were all going mad jumping all over each other and um, and they're all sort of they thought was there a delay on our telly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they even sent security into the They did. The security yeah, came in to see what was going on. <laughs> and obviously, you know, then that was like the last kick of the game. So the game was over then. But it, we have know, been spoiled for moments this year. I would say yeah. that Alfreton that was only for a point, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah like some Gloucester away was ridiculous. Jamie yeah. laughed because well, we were in, we were in the away end. I quite like it in the away end even. Mm. And he just said I tried to climb over the barrier. <laughs> I, kind of, I kind of forgot myself. Yeah, not, yeah, not onto yeah, the yeah, pitch. Yeah, yeah. The barrier halfway back. Yeah. yeah. Must the goal go? The, the winning goal goes in. My son's gone. He's seventeen. So, he's fine. <laughs> so I've then kind of tried to, <laughs> to run down to the front, forgetting that I'm actually supposed to be like a responsible individual. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Jamie's going, you, you try to get over that. <laughs> so it's not give me a load of stick about that. But then, like I said, yeah, that was that one. There was a spending more home game. Yeah, it was yeah, extraordinary yeah. with last scoring a goal and then Cowles cutting one yeah, in the top bag. Great, yeah, great goals. Great, yeah. you know, just great goals. And, you know, that was an Alfreton. Rochdale at home. Yeah, that was great. He yeah, was well, scoring yeah. that goal. Yeah, and that was, you know, that was a massive moment. You know, in, you know, big moment for our season as well. So we've been spoiled really for moments this year. You kind of, yeah, there's any number that you can look at. You know, and that's been, and that's been one of the great things, hasn't it? We've had a team that's been full of character and actually you're going to go down. You're not thinking we're done here. No, no. You actually you still got that little yeah. bit of hope that actually we're not going to be found wanting in terms of trying to get something out of this game. Yeah, yeah for sure. And you know, hopefully, some great moments to come still this season. Yeah. And we, if we can make those playoffs, what an achievement that'll be. Um, and and of course next season. Let's make some more memories. That's, that's exactly right. I think, I think I think we can't have any complaints coming about what we've been treated no. to this year. No, absolutely. Whichever, yeah. you know, whether you're wearing your, your fans hat, your chairman mm -hmm. hat, your podcast mm -hmm. legends hat. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting we there, can't definitely. Can't we're, there. Yeah, we're, we're wearing it to walk around the uh, supermarket now, you know. But, uh, absolutely right. I, love, <laughs> I just like the way you got dropped off in a car. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you've got to maintain that, you know. 
that image really. Yeah. People tell me about New London folk. That's yeah. why I've seen it now. I've got sunglasses. Yeah. 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 Obviously too much money in London. Um, well look, thank you very much for, for, yeah. for joining us today. Um, we've had a great, great time speaking to you. Um, just want to say the next podcast will be out next week. Um, this one obviously will be this week, but by the time it comes out, you'll know that. Um, so but we'll have a record, and obviously we'll be talking about a lot of games. Um, the Buxton game today, we've got Banbury Wednesday, and then Scunthorpe uh, next Saturday. So there'll be a lot to talk about, and hopefully we'll be in the playoffs by the next time we speak. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.